When we begin to consider human social cognition, the human social order, and the manner in which it affects and constructs our lives, it seems sensible to ask around and ask, well, what does a social order look like through other lenses? What about the social order of other animals, for example? Is there anything that we can learn there? Now, when it comes to matters to do with language and culture and indeed social, the social structures we live in, it's easy to have a very blinkered view because we all come from somewhere very specific. And we tend to think that the way things are done around here is the way that they should be done. Um, anthropology provides a very useful corrective to this for cognitive science by illustrating some of the diversity of human social order. Anthropology goes further and tries to understand the many kinds of human social order in a broader landscape, looking both back through history, so in paleoanthropology, trying to see what were early societies like, um, and also across the species boundary. So primatologists, for example, study the behavior of apes um, in order to see what we can learn from that about our own social order. And of course, there are biological uh, aspects to anthropology as well, looking at biological variation. But biological variation among human populations is relatively small, whereas cultural variation is huge. Now, we pointed out in the last video that the um, change in the white of the eye may have led to uh, a great change in human patterns of interaction because we were paying attention to the same things at the same time. And perhaps you've tried to point something out to a dog at some stage and found that dogs are lousy at following your pointing gestures. If you hold out a finger and point, the dog's likely to sniff your finger. So not all animals clearly demonstrate this dense web of joint attention. Do chimpanzees? Well, Tomasello has looked into this. And chimpanzees do pay attention to what other, where other chimpanzees are looking, but the signal they have to go on is not very good because of their dark eyeball. So they pay attention to the direction in which the head is turned, but not they can't follow the eyes, whereas we are notoriously sensitive to where someone is looking. We pay attention to the eyes. Now, where are we on the tree of life? Well, we're out in, in a very particular neighborhood. We are continuous, of course, with all, last form, all life forms, but we are particularly closely related as a species to the great apes. And the last common ancestor of the chimpanzee and the human, I see here is pegged at 5 to 15 million years ago. That's quite a large window. I think it's more commonly understood as... So five to six million years ago. If we zoom in on that <clears throat> local part of the tree of life, we find this branching structure. So about 15 million years ago, the orangutans split off. And about eight million years ago, the gorillas split off. And then there was this further split about five or six million years ago. And one branch led to humans, as well as other hominids who have since died out. And the other branch led to bonobos and chimpanzees. Speciation is gradual and may not always be clear. So other hominids, for example, are still present in the uh, Homo sapiens line. Um, so somewhere from this last common ancestor five or six million years ago to the present, all these changes happened. Now the apes themselves, of course, are within the tree and their nearest neighbors are the let's say they're, they're in a much larger family called the primates. The primates includes the apes and monkeys and tarsiers and lorises and lemurs and lots of other colourful characters, which you may see if you go to the zoo or Madagascar. Great place for them. Um, but it's these great apes, the chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas and orangutans, that we are definitely most closely related to and that we can learn most from studying. And please don't confuse monkeys with apes. This Evolutionary descent is very important, and we have much more in common with these particular animals than we do with your average monkey. So here's a little video about culture within chimpanzees, an idea that 30 or 40 years ago would have seemed very daring and controversial and is now universally accepted. Although termite fishing is common among chimps, 
Every group has its own tools and techniques. These are a part of their traditions, their cultures. Chimp culture? The term seems like an oxymoron. We like to think of culture as the pinnacles of human achievement, of art, history, and science. But in anthropological terms, culture is the transmission of group knowledge from one generation to another. Little Teva is doing her best to master one of the great arts of her culture, whether she knows it or not. It usually takes four or five years to master the technique, but today she has an early triumph. The idea of chimp culture, once radical, is now increasingly accepted among primatologists. Chimps around Africa use different techniques to smash nuts and fruits. Some use wooden hammers and anvils, some stones. And the Fungoli chimps slam baobab fruits against stones or trees. One of the most interesting and subtle things most chimps engage in is something called leaf clipping, biting off bits of leaves with a distinct popping sound to get each other's attention. But it means different things in different places. In some places, it's a come on to the ladies. Here in Fungoli, it's a back off to other males. Or a part of an exciting development in their lives like a nice fruit tree. Right now they're sort of advertising themselves, but also just excited because they're starting to eat again. I mean, chimps get excited about everything. Here in Fungoli, leaf clipping among males leads inevitably to extravagant tantrums. <laughs> Traditions passed down from adult to child. It's a flow of knowledge that once only we seemed capable of. Remarkable. So we find it fairly easy to recognize now the hallmarks of culture in the cross-generational transmission of skills, for example, tools, technologies, we see this in primates. What if we go further afield? Well, if we go right down to the level of the insect, we find a lot of animals have a form of social organization which is radically different from ours. These are called eusocial animals, and they include things like bees, termites, and ants. Um, within a eusocial order, you are born into a particular social role and you will die in that social role. There is no such thing as upward mobility or the chance to better yourself. There are clearly differentiated roles. So within an ant's nest, we may find some um, individuals whose job is to tend to the young, some individuals whose job is to act as warriors, some whose job is to forage, and of course, the distinguished individual in the queen. Um, and everything is very, very fixed. This provides a kind of a stability but it seems very alien to us. And in the 19th century, when this was intensively studied, this was the first time that the social order came to be seen as having its own power, as it were. And people were very frightened. Imagine, they were very frightened by ants and the social order that they saw there. And they were concerned that humans might have similar tendencies or that we might develop into this kind of rigid, fixed hierarchy. There's no danger of that. We are very, very different from ants, but we can learn a lot from such creatures. One thing we can learn is that the social order is largely independent of the nature of the individual. So we find this in many kinds of insects, but there's actually one kind of mammal that we find a eusocial order in, showing that it doesn't ha have anything to do with having six legs and on a, an insect body. 
There is a, a kind of a, a mammal called the naked mole rat. There is a few species found in Somalia and Kenya and in Ethiopia and Namibia. And these live underground and they have a eusocial order, quite unique among mammals, in which social roles are fixed. Uh, a queen is the childbearing individual. And um, let's just have a little look at a video of the naked mole rat. The naked mole rat. Although it's neither a mole nor a rat. Much about their behavior is strange. They spend their entire lives in virtually complete darkness, weaving their way through an underground network of burrows and tunnels. Within their dark universe, they've evolved a rigid society that has more in common with ants or bees than with a typical mammalian social circle. At the top is a long, strong queen. She is the mother of all the other mole rats in the colony, which may total a few dozen or a few hundred. As long as she lives, she and a few chosen boy toys are the only ones that breed. The queen keeps the rest from mating by sheer intimidation. Their lives are all work and no foreplay. Some mole rats are drafted as soldiers to protect the colony from rival mole rats and predators. A quick sniff determines insider from outsider. Other mole rats tend to the young, clean burrows, dig tunnels, and look for food. Their giant incisors actually are outside their mouths, so the mole rats can shovel away without eating dirt. They dig in teams. The lead digger carves out the tunnel. Others pass the dirt back up the tunnel and out onto the surface. Going backwards or forwards is all the same. Though nearly blind, special hairs on their body help guide them and tell them where they're going. And even when traveling in the tunnels, each one's status in the hierarchy is clearly visible. The more senior members of the colony take the high road while the juniors wriggle through underneath. The tunnels are only a few inches wide, but a full-fledged colony can stretch for half a mile. All this work is done to find their principal food, tubers scattered across the savanna. One of these giant roots can feed a colony for two to three weeks. And though they are born into a strict hierarchy, when it comes to food, everyone is equal. So the naked mole rat teaches us a very important lesson, which is that the emergent social order is not dependent on the particular constitution of the body. Um, so one is not condemned to any one social order based on the body. Now, back in the 19th century, when the society was first being investigated in this fashion and the social order came into view, Darwin had only just happened a few decades before in the theory of evolution. And one of the reasons that that theory was so strongly resisted was because people didn't want to see themselves as cousins of, of apes. They were afraid. They looked at apes and they didn't see nice Christian gentlemen. And they were shocked and horrified at the idea that we would be of the same order as the apes. Um, and of course, as the 
branching of the tree of evolution became a little clearer, it was chimpanzees that they were most concerned about, because those are our nearest neighbours. At that stage, the differentiation between chimpanzees and bonobos was not yet known. Um, and the grave concern was that if we accepted the theory of evolution, then we would be revealing ourselves to be like the apes, because we have very, very similar bodies. And so there was a sort of a, a fear of a determinism in the social order. Um, we'll have a look at that now. So primates in general differ hugely from insect social orders in that they spend their entire time um, bettering themselves, making sure that they at least don't drop in the social hierarchy and preferably improve their lot. By going to university, you're doing the same thing. You're acting as a, as, as a primate and working to better your own life. Um, and the fear was that the chimpanzees that they saw, who are uncannily, they bear an uncanny relation to us, um, but they are clearly very different as well, and sometimes quite savage. There was a fear that because they were evolutionary, close in an evolutionary sense, that we would be, if we accepted evolution, condemning ourselves to something like understanding ourselves as chimps. Now, since then, we've realized that that branch split into chimpanzees and bonobos. And so we're as closely related to both species as we are. Um, um, we're no more closely related to one than the other. And at this stage, we can calm those fears because quite clearly there is no determinism involved as these two animals have developed quite different social orders. They differ greatly from each other. Um, it's useful to compare them and to see that even though they are from the outside very, very similar animals, they have quite different social structures. In general, they both have well-developed primate orders with um, large communities with open subgroups. Uh, they differ, as do human cultures, in who leaves the group and goes to join another group. They don't have marriage, of course, but um, they do still pair bond. And for the chimpanzee, it's usually the males that move out and either form their own group or join another group, whereas in the bonobo communities, it's the females who go out. And in general, males occupy a patriarchal position in chimpanzee societies, whereas the bonobos is a matriarchy. It's the females who are in charge, despite the fact that they have strong mother-child bonds in each case. They take care of each other and they groom each other, but their, their social interactions are clearly distinct when it comes to sex. So in the chimpanzee, sex is tied to reproduction and they have lots of sex when a female is fertile, but if they have a dispute, they fight it out. Bonobos use sex for, for reproduction, but they also use sex to settle all kinds of disputes. And they very, very casually, and to the absolute horror of the, those who first realize this behavior, they engage in wanton, promiscuous, multi-party, varied sex of every kind you can imagine at the drop of a hat. Um, so sex plays a hugely different role, and it leads to far less aggression within the bonobo communities. They are not hippie chimpanzees. They don't, they don't live entirely peaceful lives. They do fight sometimes. But the distinction is nonetheless very, very clear. Um, they seem to be equally clever, equally cultured, as it were. Um, the form in which they hunt is different, simply because of the different gender roles, the males are the hunters for the chimpanzees and the females are the hunters for the bonobos. Now, in the context of an educational video, I'm not going to show you everything that bonobos do. I'm going to leave it at that. But we'll have a look at, at a little video of some bonobos missing out on the very raunchy parts. Takayoshi Kano has led the research here in Wamba Zaire for the past 22 years. He comes here in search of the second little-known species of chimpanzee. Sugarcane is a sweet lure used to call down the elusive bonobo. Dr. Kano and his associate Chia Hashimoto have discovered that bonobos are quite distinct from the chimps studied by Goodall and Bush. At first glance, they're different, 
Although they've been called pygmy chimps, they're not smaller, just more slightly built. Hunted elsewhere in Zaire, they're safe here, but wary still. The sugarcane buffet proves irresistible. At ease on two legs, as well as on four, they simply rise up and walk, so their hands are free to carry the cane. Eerily, their long, shapely limbs and upright gait recall our own prehistoric forebears. And their natural two-legged gait is only the first surprise they have in store for us. An impressively stern female enters and snaps a young sapling. Once she picks herself up, she does something entirely surprising for a female chin. She displays, and the maids give her sway. For this is the confident stride of the group's leader. It's Alpha Female, whom Kano has named Haru. They walk on two legs. They have a matriarchy with alpha females. Very, very interesting. One detail to the social lives of primates, including monkeys, is uh, the ability to reconcile disputes. Now, in a eusocial social order like the ants, you don't get disputes. Um, you have your social role, you know what to do, and that's what you're going to do. But when everyone's jostling for position, then um, disputes will necessarily break out. And among many primate species, there have developed means for reconciliation, something we are still as humans not all that good for doing. And yet we found ways to get over disputes, means of reconciliation, in more than 25 different primate species. And these are very, very important for ensuring that the social order is maintained. And it goes so far that uh, in chimpanzees, they will actually send in a mediator to a dispute. So an older chimpanzee will send in an experienced chimpanzee to mediate in a dispute between two entirely separate ones. A bit like the United Nations or, or hostage negotiations. Very, very thought out, very thoughtful and very important in making sure that trouble, violence, doesn't get out of control. So reconciliation, the means to get over disputes, is a really important part of what we now increasingly call culture, also among the apes. So there's a lot to be learned from other animals here.